Our second speaker is Dr. Linson Alapart, whose passion is to deliver holistic care for elderly patients, working together with their GPs, family and community care providers through a multidisciplinary healthcare approach. He also provides comprehensive outpatient geriatric services at Infinity Specialists here in Toowoomba and holds a permanent position at the Toowoomba and Ipswich hospitals. Hello, good evening everyone. So we are coming into the next phase. Now the patients have been diagnosed with dementia and they are the other extreme now. So we are coming into the, what do we call, the fun phase or probably <laughs> what we are going to deal with, all right? So can I start by acknowledging the staff here who usually works on the, star, on, on the floor and the hard work they do with the challenging patients because they are the ones who are more with those patients and how, I mean, as medical professionals, we come in, see them, give them a plan, but the staff on the floor, they see them more regularly than us. Put out a hand to all of them here this year. I really appreciate them. <clears throat> so I was putting up the slides and um, I sent it to Christy to hand, I mean, pass it on to um, Jenny and team. And she was asking me, what is this? Is it what I'm thinking or is it something else? And I'm sure those on the, sta those on the floor would know. Um, who are working closely would clearly understand what it is. Because all the others are faces and people versus the hands. I'm sure everyone, if there's anyone who doesn't know, can they put their hands up? <laughs> See, everyone knows. So everyone knows about geriatrics. So, um, so coming to BPSD, what we are going to do is try to understand the challenges. Hello? Yeah. So understand the challenges in dealing with the challenging behaviors. So all behaviors are not challenging. We expect the residents when they come into the residential aged care facility to lead a meaningful life and to have some sense of enjoyment trying to explore the surroundings. But when they do that, they transgress some of the norms of the facility when they start wandering into other people's places and it's being termed as challenging behaviors, unfortunately. And some of, them, some of the challenging behaviors are when intimate cares are being done. And this is one of the areas that we'll be touching upon, and I'm sure there's quite a number of people here on the staff, and the, among the people working would understand that that's one of the main, major challenges that staff face, and that's when the behaviors, behaviors get aggressive. And you need to understand that, yes, these people have dementia, but when these cares are being done, they have a sense of shame and embarrassment and the means of their expression is probably the aggression and the calling out or the swearing. We're going to also look at strategies of how to deal with these patients and how to have some patient-centered approach. In BPS, I mean, Lemia has touched upon BPSD briefly during her talk. There are two factors with, which impact on the behaviors. One is the short-term memory loss, and the other is the lack of insight when the dementia progresses. So when the short-term memory declines, the person is unable to participate in standard therapies that we advise with regards to non-pharmacological measures and things. 
And as the dementia progresses, they get disoriented to time, place, and the things surrounding them. And they get decoupled from the reality. That's when they feel that they are living with the disease. The disease spouse is in the same place, or they're having young children and the like. And when this is coupled with the lack of insight as the dementia progresses, it's difficult for them to be persuaded that what they perceive is the truth. And it makes it hard for implementing any non-pharmacological measures. And that's when we need to direct those measures towards the carers. So with that, we'll go on to can you the next slide, please. The prevalence, as Lemmy was mentioning, there's a significant prevalence of the BPSD, about 60 to 90 percentage across the spectrum. Next slide, please. What's the impact of BPSD. We all know it increases the disability, increased hospitalization, increased chances of institutionalization earlier, and the financial burden. I was looking through some of the papers, and this was from about five to six years ago that they were saying the cost of maintaining a resident with dementia in the nursing homes annually is around 100,000. So this is about six or seven years ago. Add in BPSD on top of that, it, well, I mean, it increases manifold, and this is what we are speaking about six or seven years ago. And the cost of living has gone up, so the price would have, I mean, the cost would have gone up manifold as well. Next slide, please. So, with BPSD, we are looking at different clusters. And the most common clusters that we manifest, that we get called upon, is the aggression, agitation, or the psychosis, because these are the things that need urgent attention. And we call out for them because it can be the, the person with the dementia, all the other residents, all the carers that can be at harm, harm, I mean risk of harm, and that's the reason why we get called out. But equally, the other clusters which include the apathy where people are withdrawn and getting depressed, those are equally distressing for the residents, but underreported and probably undertreated, because the time and the effort taken to manage the people with the aggression and the agitation and the psychosis takes a huge chunk of the time and the effort from the staff as well as the medical. So some of them is underreported. Can you go to the next slide, please? There's a number of factors involved in the BPSD. Some are modifiable, some are non-modifiable. You can't change the life events, you can't change the brain changes that happen at this stage, not at the stage where we were discussing earlier in the talk with Lemia. But at this stage, the changes that are due to happen has already happened and is not at a stage where it can be reversed. The personality, pre-morbid personality, the life history of any history of childhood abuse and other things, those are things that can't be changed now and those are unmodifiable factors. Those that we can change are the unmet needs. Care stress, the quality of care that we provide, the sensory system like the vision, hearing, and the fluency in the language, especially with the turnover of staff and people being recruited, it's important to have that fluency in the language. As much as that's concerned, we are going into a phase where 
in the next 10 or 15 or 20 years, we are going to have the culturally diverse population where we are going to find we need staff who are able to have proficiency in the language of these people as well because those people are probably going to forget the English by the time they're demented. They're probably going to be, um, yeah, I can probably speak for myself in 20 years time. I wish I had someone who probably knows my language and he's able to take care of me at the time. <laughs> All right, um, next slide please. So this is a Hindu festival from my town. Um, you can see the elephants lined up before the temple. You can see, I mean, if you uh, count, there are about 12 or 13, but in reality, there are about 25 to 30 elephants lined up for, on that day for the first twelve. It's, um, it happens in April. And there's only one elephant in the center that holds the statue of the deity. And I was showing to Ganga about um, this, I mean, going through the slides with him, and he was asking, what if one of them causes trouble? <laughs> <laughs> Just like what if one of our, I mean, residents caused trouble with BPSD? Yeah. So it's one of the local festivals um, with these elephants that's uh, immaculately decorated and stays there for a couple of hours, including a procession around the temple. Next slide, please. So now we are going to go through some case discussions, which I would want everyone here to be interactive and give your thoughts and your comments on, okay? So steady one, this is a 71 year old who has been referred because of verbal aggression. She has been a resident for about three months at the facility. Prior to this, she had a lengthy stay in hospital for viral encephalitis. She had traveled up to northern Queensland to be with her son. She had two sons, one in Toowoomba and one in northern Queensland. So she had traveled up there and she contracted viral encephalitis, lengthy stay, and subsequently went to rehab in one of the private facilities there. And there was significant functional decline and cognitive decline that was noted during the allied health assessments. And family discussions ensued and the assessments declared that she lacked capacity to make decisions as well as to live by herself. And she was um, consenting to nursing home placement and she was placed in Toomba in a nursing home. Her complaints were that she would be assaulted if she were to come out of the room and collateral history from staff reports that she was verbally and sometimes physically aggressive with the staff. And the physical aggression is sometimes throwing stuff on the floor, not onto the staff, but verbally aggressive and swearing. What would you want to do with this lady? Do you want to know anything more? Sorry? Yep. Mm -hmm. So she was in the hospital for about a month. Um, and subsequently for a month of rehab to see whether she could get improved. And no, no, everything fine. Yep. Yep, no problems eating and drinking. She, her rooms kept clean. All good. 
Sorry? No causes of delirium identified. Oh, yep. Yep. Family does visit. Um, she gets angry with them, but not physically aggressive. So, yep. Sorry. No. Yep. Any thoughts on what she, I mean, what was referred for? She was mentioning that she was being assaulted. Trauma in the past. Any other thoughts? New environment. Yep. Yep. So, uh, dwelling more into history, went to visit this lady as part of the team from ages here. This is a wonderful team. Uh, love working with the team. Uh, so, went to visit this lady. So, she's in the memory support unit of the facility. And when we get down to the to her room, there's a small corridor with doors on either side for the rooms, okay? So these are, I mean, when asking the staff, it was confirmed that these rooms does have people with advanced dementia and BPSD. Sorry? Yep, and they do a, agree that there are residents who can be doing the corridor and they can be physically aggressive towards other residents. So that was one of the things. I mean, she, she was as well probably one of the victims of the physical aggression because staff is not going to be there all the time noticing the physical aggression from the residents. And sometimes those episodes of aggression can occur as a snap and they go off and the, by the time the staff is there, the, the other resident might have gone back to the room or might have gone back to a common area and they're probably not going to. And they would agree that this lady has probably hallucinations because she is in a dementia secure unit and she has lack capacity, she has had recent viral encephalitis, all things ganged up against her. And um, the other thing that she was mentioning is that she didn't want to be there. She didn't want to be, her own words were, I didn't belong here. Okay. So one of the other things that is important here is to understand what the pre-morbid conditions are, how she was before this. And that's important to sit down with her and know what it is. So when we went to see this patient and we had the son on speakerphone throughout the episode, throughout the consultation, and she reported that she had been working for Commonwealth Bank until about five years ago. And she had been working for about 30 years prior. Prior to her episode of viral encephalitis, she was independent and she had, and the son confirms that there was no cognitive concerns with regards to this lady. She was independent, she could function with regards to her ADLs or her banking or her other details and she was very independent. What would you think was going on here? Sorry? The staff reports that they didn't have to do anything for her. She was completely independent within the facility and they didn't need to do anything for her and she was, her room was clean. So. Yep. Sorry, Donna?
Yep. Any other thoughts? Yes, that's right, Kerry. So it's just once he had all those information here, he asked us, son, what do you think? What do you think mom's like? And he was like, I think mom's better now. And so one of those things that we commonly face, especially with, um, we were just discussing about bed pressures in the hospital and whatnot, a decision sometimes is made earlier than necessary with regards to a person's capacity and the ability to look after themselves. And in this lady, it was a tragic case of a decision made early with regards to her capacity to make, to look after herself. She is not someone who was trialed with any home care package or anything before she was transferred into a nursing home. So, rightfully so, as Donna was mentioning, she was depressed, and as he was saying, she had lost her identity, and there she was. And the only way she could express was her anger and her verbal aggression. So it was not a case of BPSD. We did bring her back. There was a question of, all right, can we make a cognitive assessment at the nursing home? But I had to fight for her and say that she needs to come back to the hospital to get a cognitive assessment because she is probably not nursing home material. And we brought her back and found that she had some mild cognitive impairment but not to the extent of dementia or BPSD. And during the conversation with the son, the, we said, she, is not, she doesn't belong here. You need to make a plan. First thing, you need to set her, I mean, get her out the memory support unit, and then it's a question of discussion with the family as to where they go next, whether to community or whether she lives in the supported care if she still agrees to stay there. Any questions on this case before we move to the next interesting one? Yes? I think that's really important because once a clinician takes away a person's capacity, other clinicians, once they come on board and start seeing, they, are, they tend not to review the, or change the capacity. But I would say that you need to be brave enough to do that because at the end of the day, this is someone's life and you should, I mean, as we say, anyone is deemed to have capacity unless otherwise, sh I mean, you should respect the, I mean, it's a human right issue. Hmm. Yep. We said she had the capacity to make decisions at that time, and she was agreeable to move into the main division of the nursing home, as we are saying, outside of the memory support unit, until further discussion, because she had nowhere else to go, because the accommodation has been sold for payment. So it was up to the family having a discussion as to where she goes, whether she stays, and indeed she continued to stay at the nursing home uh, reluctantly because she felt that was a better choice because she could get more support. She had insight that she had some functional decline and needed some support.
to sometimes come and see a patient in a ward that we have never seen before, and could you come and do the assessments of capacity? And I find myself in a very difficult position to make that capacity. Often when they are too sick, we, uh, we walk away. And that's not the best time to make the capacity because the patient is having an episode of delirium during this period of time. And that's the time they need to go back and or come see them in the outpatient setting. But there had been a few instances in the private hospitals, St. Andrew's Hospital might come and ask, can, I come, can you come and have the assessment? And they can't do any, go anywhere with the discharge planning. So in that sense, we are very careful to say that, I, I myself say, at the point of time I am assessing, this patient does not have the capacity, but this can change, and this needs to be reassessed periodically, and specifically to the GPs to assess that. It's different to someone you have, so we have some patients I've been seeing since 2014. I've diagnosed dementia at that time, mild cognitive impairment, gone through the stages that Lemia was explaining, now gone into much more advanced stage, and I pretty much know this is not returning back. And, and I'm more comfortable saying at that time, this is advanced dementia, she has lost the capacity and this is going to be a permanent situation. So any healthcare professional, I think the, the lesson we have learned from this case is to not to jump into conclusion. And because once a geriatrician or especially someone makes that decision, often other medical professionals sometimes find it difficult to reverse that. It's like cardiology starting on do two antiplatelets. Nobody wants to touch that until they have a major GI bleed after 10 years, something like that. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? I find it difficult with capacity assessments because people have capacity for different decisions. Like they can decide, she could probably decide what colour shirt she wants to wear. She can decide what she wants to eat for dinner. She can decide if she wants to have a shower or not. But um, when you're writing a capacity assessment, there's so many things you could make a decision about that it's difficult to just give an umbrella term. She no longer has capacity. I think it, you really need, well, I try to be very specific about whether it's financial or the capacity to decide where she's going to reside. Um, and, yeah, I don't know if you've got any suggestions for us about that. <laughs>
uh, because of the family of one, probably, and the nursing home have rules that. <laughs> totally. That's exactly what the referral is for. Um, I, I didn't mean to say anything. I suppose when it comes to this, I mean, my approach is that if two people are having sexual intercourse, what spectrum of capacity do you need? Do you need very high level capacity? Is, it's like what uh, uh, the last la nice lady, Diana, sorry, said just now. Is capacity for sexual intercourse similar to having capacity to choose an ice cream? Or is it somewhere in the higher end where it's capacity to change your will? I mean, I would argue it's on the ice cream end, because the worst that could happen is, well, someone didn't like it as much. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the, the, the consequences of, a, of a, them having a sexual relationship are quite small. So I, I would feel that framing this as a capacity assessment is the wrong way forward. It's about talking to both families and telling them about what's going on. Because it's, it's not... No one's actually getting harmed here is what I'm seeing. That's how I would approach it. And I would speak to the families and talk to them about it. If they're still unhappy, there might not be a huge amount that I can do about it, is the truth. Um, and consenting is, is, is very difficult. Yeah. That, that, that's my take. Anyway. Thank you. I'm going to put it out to the floor here where you got stuff from the nursing home. How would you be dealing with this? Yes, you, oh, got some okay. We actually have had this sort of situation at work before, yep. uh, where we've had a man who's married uh, with severe progressed dementia um, and another lady who had severe dementia as well, um, and they liked to hold hands and kiss and things like that. Uh, we had family conference with his wife, discussed her thoughts on it, what how she took it um, and she was happy as long as he was happy um, and so when she was there we would not separate them but we would guide him to another area and they would have a cup of tea and by the time they had their cup of tea he had forgotten about the other lady uh, but every time his wife would leave he would venture back to her so um, his wife was happy and it didn't hurt anybody so yeah that's that's how we did it. Well I'm just going to ask the team here. <laughs> Who would be willing to take that? Yeah. Um, from our point of view, it's about talking with families as well. Human contact is a basic human need, and it's something that's very lacking in a nursing home environment as well so it's certainly if you know it could fall into that unmet need if they're not allowed and if the families are both comfortable with that and around a reasonable conversation then yes I think they can decide what feels good as long as, one, as, long as the residents are not at harm yeah okay So I suppose the challenge comes to, it, it really comes down to family. So we've all had that situation and we've had one in our resident who was very fond of a lady there and his wife was absolutely adamant, absolutely adamant. And his dementia was so severe, of course, we couldn't take him out of the memory unit. And so that caused a lot of unsettledness and a lot of violence. It, her behaviour escalated because she was kept away from him because that was a family request. So my only issue is there is to making sure that they're physically both okay because 
we have the history of having um, syphilis di um, diagnosed in about their 80s. So you still have to make sure that they're both physically well before they enter into intercourse relationship because I've, I've diagnosed syphilis in their 80s. That's so, yeah, and very undiagnosed, no symptoms until the advanced dementia and that was because they had syphilis of the brain and that was in their 80s when they got... Exactly, so he was in his 80s when he got diagnosed. So that would be my only, but our biggest challenge, it's not the residents, I think that everyone, and it isn't me that's probably not being met, but it's families. Yes, unfortunately it's the families. Yeah. Yep. Is anyone? Um, syphilis isn't on the screening for dementia, is it anymore? It used to be. Um, but not not for the base anymore, I don't think, is it? Um, we can still do it, but I, no, sorry. Okay, take it back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a long time ago, it used to be on the on the when we referred people, yep. but it's it's not on there anymore. HIV is not there or anything like that. So yeah. yeah we've actually changed the um, antenatal guidelines because it's so prevalent. Okay. But that's mostly, right. it's higher prevalence in indigenous yeah. populations, of course. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We, in fact, actually, I remember when we started the memory clinic, that was a must. That was a must investigation for us. But then uh, uh, sometimes you get a letter back by the GPs asking, can you look at this? There's lots of tests. And I myself, I remember looking at this and, <laughs> and uh, thought, to be honest, I haven't seen one yet. Uh, of the, all those tests, uh, whether it, uh, one was positive, and this, if I can remember right, we, we no longer ask for this anymore, isn't it? Now we might probably need to look at this again, and if that is the case, yeah. So, I mean, we'll just come back to them, not finish with this, but some of the ages, views, and myths that is in the society is that elderly people don't have. Sorry, the mic doesn't want to listen. Okay. Elderly people don't want to have sex. They're not interested. They can't have, or they stop having relationships. Those, those are some of the myths that's out there. One of the statistics that was put up in an Australian study a few years ago, they, sh they state that about 40 percentage between 75 to 79 are still sexually active. 30 percentage between 80 to 84 and 20 percentage between 85 to 90. All right. So that's as um, one of you was, I mean, uh, Natalie was mentioning, there's, a un, there's one of the unmet needs probably. And we need to make sure that we don't just sweep it under the carpet by making rules and separating, but deal with it pragmatically is we don't have a clear answer to that question and unfortunately it also needs some clear education to the staff on the floor as to how to deal with the situation because you can't have different staff coming in and having different set of rules because of the cultural or religious beliefs here. You can set a pattern, but if the staff is going to come and have their own rules because of their beliefs, then it becomes hard, and it makes it difficult for how we set some guidelines with regards to these situations. So as regards to, um, next slide. So there was this incident, I mean, I'm quoting all this from a recent talk, which was really great by Dr. Cindy Jones, who was here at the base hospital, who gave a lecture for about four hours on sexualities and dementia. And the other webinar that I was watching on YouTube was um, from Dementia Support Australia on intimacy and sexualities with dementia. So that was, two lectures, it was really good, and this was an uh, incident that was quoted in one of those talks where a 78-year-old legislator in U.S. was 
I mean, got married, the second marriage, both of them uh, who had the, I mean, uh, the first partners who have died and they married in the early 70s. After the marriage, two or three years into the marriage, she the lady started to get cognitive decline and subsequently after six or seven years later, the dementia progressed to the point that she had to end up in a nursing home. And once she entered into the nursing home, the children from her first marriage made an appointment with him and with him, in, with this legislator included, with the GP, to make a document stating that she lacked mental capability to make a decision to consent for sexual activity. And so he should not have that. He agreed with that and moved on. But one day, um, the adjacent room, uh, adjacent resident heard some noises from her, from um, this particular person's room, which she felt was concerning for sexual activity, and reported this to the staff, who reported it to the children, who brought out a legal case against it, where he pleaded not guilty, but she had to go through the whole test of a rape test and all those medical investigations to the hospital, and the investigation went on for a prolonged period of time, and the word it was after she died, when it, um, he was proved to be not guilty by the jury. The reasons behind how the jury came to this conclusion is still not reported, whether it was because they felt she had the ability to consent, or whether there was insufficient evidence. But one of the points to note is that just because a patient or the resident doesn't have capacity to make a financial decision or the ability to look after herself and hence being in the nursing home doesn't equate to consent with regards to other activities. And there is no clear answer as to how the guidelines would be with regards to this, but I think it is going to be, depending on a case-by-case -case discussion, as um, Ken was mentioning, having the discussion with the families and trying to respect their thoughts, but at the same time, making sure that we have a patient-centered approach with regards to the patient before us. Any other thoughts? It's good to hear that there are quite a few who have encountered such scenarios and dealt with them in a proper way. It's nice to hear that too. If we don't have any other thoughts, we might move on to the next one. Okay. okay. All right. So this is the beautiful scenic view from our state in southern India. Uh, if you ever go over to India, try to go to Kerala, which is the southern tip, and is most famous for the backwaters and the houseboats and the seafood, if you wish to, if you allow that. Okay, next. So this is another 80-year-old resident who was presenting to us with um, behavioral issues, being sent out from a rural hospital multiple times because of physical aggression and verbal aggression, throwing stuff. This is someone who reports he's being on a diet of laminate three times a day. He has pain issues with his wrist. He's withdrawn, and he has a background history of advanced Parkinson's with associated dementia, hypertension, polypharmacy, and um, he, his background is that he used to be an avid baker, gardener, and independent until about 12 months ago, and he used to live locally. Every time he comes into the hospital, this is our uh, 
three month period. He had about three presentations. And every time he comes in into the hospital, at least on the first time he had some level of physical, I mean verbal or physical aggression, but during the subsequent events there was no issues in the hospital. And he goes back, he has this bus and they send him back. Any thoughts on what to do with this in demand? Yeah. I'll start with blood tests to check for nutritional deficiencies. Uh, that seems to be low, unfortunately. In what regard? Bs, B12, magnesium, um, iron, everything? Uh, B12 was fine to some, I mean, borderline. Um, iron was a bit low. And magnesium? Normal. Normal. I'm probably making it up, but <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. If he's got a poor oral intake and he's living on lemonade, how okay. could his bloods be good? <laughs> and I mean, I would just like to know what you're coming at. Well, poor nutrition leads to all sorts of memory issues just in general. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean it's dementia. Uh, he already had dementia. Oh, prior he already diagnosis. had prior. So okay. The right. diagnosis was not in question. It has already been made yep. prior to his host, I mean, um, nursing home placement and before his diet had changed. All right. mm -hmm. So his time? Yeah, so that was an important factor. Yep. We had some gout, so we had to go for treatment and that improved. Yep. Good. Donna's scared to talk. Um, <laughs> so we sort of look at his depression there. We're also looking at he's probably bored. Is there, you know, do we do we have him gardening? Uh, you know, is he contributing? Have we got him, you know, is he is he being active? What are we doing? Are we just shutting him in a room and he's frustrated because he's bored and he can't communicate? Have we looked at his hearing again? All the things. So go back to basics. Do the blood work up. Look at his eyesight. Look at his hearing. Look at his pain relief. All the things that we do a thousand times and then look at what are we actually doing for him. Yep. Is, he, is he participating in anything? Have we got him out? Is he going to activities? Is he just sitting there? Yeah, so you nailed it there yep. about the activities, trying to get mm. him out. Absolutely. He's someone who likes gardening, but his access to the garden is cut out because of the room, access from the room, mm. and because of his poor mobility. He's a baker. Are we making anything? Are we making pockets with him? Are we really letting him mix up? What are we doing with him? Yeah. Yeah. So Making it comes down to patient-centered care. That's correct. Trying to understand the person, yep. trying to tailor the yep. treatment or the thing rather than pharmacological, go to non-pharmacological measures. Uh, I just want to clarify. So he was aggressive at the nursing home. They sent him to hospital. When he got to hospital, he stopped being aggressive. Mm -hmm and then you discharge him back to the nursing home. So someone at the nursing home is upsetting him or treating him poorly or bullying him or yep. not being very nice and yep. he doesn't like them. Yep. So that's what I think might yep. be going on, an unmet need. So you mentioned about how we can get him involved, um, but I can't be putting it on writing and sending him, get involved with gardening, get, involved, get him involved in a bakery, I mean, or baking. What do we do next? I can't put it in discharge summary and send him, and that's not going to work. Sorry? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, some of the times, I mean, yes, you can provide the care and other things, but ultimately it also depends upon the numbers on the floor, the amount of care that can be provided. I mean, when you go to the nursing homes, you realize that, I mean, some of them are well-staffed compared to the others, and to deal with one physical aggressive patient, it takes a lot, and it takes a toll on the staff as well. So, I mean, 
the good things that you said was trying to engage him in activities. And one of the things that we did when he was in the nursing, I mean, when he was in the hospital is look at his needs, try to listen to him. We had more time to listen to him. And we understood that we tried to understand what his diets are, what he likes, what he dislikes. And by the time the third admission, when he returned back, he was on a reasonably regular diet, not on three times lemonade. He was eating and drinking. So it takes a bit of time. It takes a bit of effort and discussion with the resident. Um, they might be demented. They might have the likes and dislikes, but you need to treat them with respect and give them the time and listen to them, unfortunately, which is what most of us lacks with the workload and with the time, I mean, with the number of patients that we have, it's not something as a priority, unfortunately, that we have. And one of the small things that he liked during a stay here is one of our advanced trainees, listen, knowing that he liked to read, bought a newspaper to, for him to read. And you should see the level of appreciation that he had for this particular register when she came along the next time. So small gestures, but it went a long way in bringing around this gentleman, treating him. And to the answer to my question earlier, I mean, yes, we can tell the staff about doing this, doing that, but what we did was we went out, we went out to the, I mean, got him discharged, we set a plan to the nursing home that we are going to come out there in a few days' time. Went out there, looked at the room, as you are saying. He had difficult access to get to the garden, so we suggested changing the room and getting him access to the garden and getting him activities. And to my understanding, he has not gone, come back into the hospital again. And they have been taking, I mean, and the other thing is to let the staff know that they are not in this game alone and they have the support. That's what we are there, holding hands and reassuring the staff as well during this time. And that's important. Can I add yep. uh, that uh, this is, uh, would be a good time to introduce the AGES team if you haven't met them. And I think the most of uh, the staff is here. I think that important connection that we have, what we identify from the, is, is one thing is identifying the problems, but communicating that to the place where it needs to be actioned is another issue. And we understand with all our aged care facility staff doing a wonderful job, but often they are understaffed okay. and not enough resources there to work with. And that is why uh, Queensland Health has invested a lot of uh, resources, and we were lucky to have such a wonderful group of uh, uh, nurse navigators that we fill that, try to fill that gap between to get in that education. And uh, am I right to say that you, you, you do a lot of work is on staff education, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, they, they punch well above their weight. Absolutely, absolutely. And as, as a we can with. only do so much, but we, unless we fill that gap, it's, it's going to happen more and more. And, and identifying these gaps, we have been able to advocate more, more, more and more support for staff until we had this service as a geriatrician. I didn't know actually how much, uh, how, how much staff was working hard, but how much resources the, the places were lacking. And that is, that is where everyone needs to be looked at. Yeah. Yep. And um, I mean, what we see f as part of um, the public hospital is probably a tip of the iceberg because we get called upon when there is an issue. We get called upon because there is a difficult patient or there is a difficult situation and we deal with them. But some of the other chronic issues or the persons who are depressed or apathetic, they are in a corner because they don't create any problems for the nursing home per se. And as uh, Dr. Ganga was mentioning, it's about um, the resources um, as much as the, um, the trained resources that the facilities have, which is 
I mean, which is quite disproportionate. And some facilities, you know, have quite, a, I mean, very good staff versus others. Unfortunately, they have changing staff, and you can see the difference when two or three staff changes, two or three trained staff changes, the facility falls apart. So with that, we move on to the next slide, which everyone likes. So 90-year-old <laughs> with dementia and BPSD got type 2 diabetes, and he's a vascular path. And these are the list of medication that he's on, OK? His behavior, they're being called upon because he can be aggressive. He has been started on Respiridone. When he's taking the medication, he seems to be all right. But he's, it's a hit and miss with regards to the medication. And hence, his behaviors can be up and down depending on that day. So any thoughts on what you need to do with this one? The table here. Anyone here? <laughs> Please. Um, so I'd ask why he's on some of, I mean, we want, want to reduce his, his anticholinergics. He's on quite a few there. Yep. Uh, and we are not knowing his history, why he's on the amitriptyline. So you're starting with deep prescribing, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. for sure. So, for sure. Yeah. And given his diabetes is quite good and he's 80, you could certainly back off on, on, on his diabetes medication as well. And um, Yeah, there's quite a few medications here. Yeah. We could do a lot of deep, deep prescribing for sure. Can you start by which ones do you want to cut? Um, <laughs> it's always difficult. Um, but, yeah, I mean, he probably at 80 he doesn't need diamicron, obviously. Sorry? Uh, at 80 he doesn't need the diamicron. Uh, so we can certainly stop the dimicron. Yep. Um, and th there's always, a, you know, certainly am unless there's a, a, a reason for the amitriptyline, you know, obviously that can cause confusion, um, so that should stop. Uh, I, know, I know the geriatricians love mirtazapine, <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, <Thank> you. <laughs> potentially we could <laughs> reduce that at least. <laughs> yep. Um, and, uh, yeah, see how he goes on a reduced dose. And, and of course, stop the risperidone as well. Um, Does he need the donopexin? Uh, well, yeah, at 80, there would be, uh, sorry, 90, yeah, yeah, there wouldn't be much um, yeah. Yeah, um, um, reason what? to continue and you'd probably titrate it down yeah. and then stop it, uh, I agree. And, I mean, <laughs> again, in a 90-year-old, I know you guys like the de prescribing you probably, you, you would probably stop everything, <laughs> including, the, <laughs> including the aspirin and the atorvastatin and as well. Yeah. <laughs> and, so. and, you know, does he need the furizomide? We don't know if he needs the furizomide either, so there's... Yeah, a lot of those are yeah. just about everything except maybe the Panadol could stop. <laughs> and does he need to have a HbA1c of 6.3 for right. 90 year old? Yeah, yeah. Does he need that controlled, tightly controlled blood sugars? Yes. yes. And injecting for a patient with BPSD, hmm. probably hmm. risking harm. Yes, yes. So hmm. cut down most of. And coming back to the initial point, is he was aggressive. Is good when he takes his medications. When you have 10 medications to give, there's every chance that he's probably not going to take every 10, all of the 10. So there's a higher chance that you could probably have two or three medications, and if that includes the Respiridone, then he has a, there is a higher chance that you could probably take his medication, and that could help with compliance as well as maintaining his behaviors and then seeing down the track whether we could titrate down. Any other thoughts on that? No? And just to mention one thing, so when you do medication change, don't change all the medication in one go. Especially yes, if we're Next. talking about there is amitriptyline, denobazil, mertazabine. When you change, change one by one. Because when the behavioral change, you will not know where is the problem from which one. And try to reduce it. Amitriptyline always reduces it rather than just to stop it. Yep. So oh, we the problem is, is that that doesn't happen. They come back from hospital and suddenly they're not on anything. <laughs> so it's nice yeah. to say that, but does, it often that doesn't happen. It, they come, come back with yeah, a lot of, lot of changes. And we get confused. We don't know why things were stopped or, you know, and it, it, yeah, it, it can be very, I agree, you should stop one at a time. <laughs> no, I agree. I think there was sometimes miscommunication. In the, in the hospital, a little bit different, to be honest. You know, if they come 
very drowsy, very ill. We suspect it could be palliative, actually, especially from the nursing home. Sometimes we stop everything. He's in the hospital. We'll observe them more closer. But when they're getting better and we're sending them to the nursing home, it, it might be a little bit tricky. And, and you are not available for them all the time to have a look to them every day. You know, for that, if you do it as elective described, just do it slowly, one by one. Yeah, and in this case, you can see the, he's on anticoagulation. However, there is no past medical history of, uh, for anything specific. We don't know. And yeah. sometimes it's a history of a historical BTE, which no one has bothered mm. to mm. look into the reasons for continuation of the anticoagulant. So yeah. those are things that needs to be looked at. And as this says, it's important to know what sort of patient has the disease, not. So that's quite important. Um, can we go to the next slide? Um, for want of time, I think we are running out, is it? So we might, yeah, we I mean, a couple of other things, if you can go to the next one. Um, yeah. Sometimes it's this, probably not BPSD, but uh, I mean, family expectations as to what needs to be in a 100-year-old. We don't want to go there, but. <laughs> uh, management of patients needs to be patient-centered. Um, making sure that families and carers are engaged in the care and involved in the decision-making. And looking at I mean, as we were mentioning in a baker trying to, or a gardener trying to involve them in the activities. Um, a interesting scenario with, that we had was a long time resident at the base. Um, he was not on our team, but I remember he was not in the nursing home yet, but was waiting for the nursing home. I was finding it difficult because of his behaviors. And his history is his. Uh, ex psychiatry nurse. So one day I was, I mean, we were going there for the rounds and we saw the morning handover happening in a gender medical team behind locked doors and a rectangular shaped table with this resident at the head of the table having a handover sheet and a pen in hand. Very quiet, listening to everything, no problems at all. So trying to do activities that can involve them and make them appreciated. Because they're not, I mean, there's no confidentiality patient. He doesn't remember what's going on in the street. He doesn't know how to read. So there's nothing to be worried about there. Uh, some general tips that we say is making sure that you come through from the friend of the patient, making eye contact, making sure that you are not in a, having a threatening voice or um, having a gentle voice and um, avoiding arguments and try avoiding any physical restraint as much as possible. Obviously, if any other resident or staff is at risk, obviously we need that. But otherwise, trying to avoid physical restraint wherever possible because it's only aggravating the situation and you're going to only have a vicious circle going around trying to pin him down to give more, I mean, um, subcut medications to settle him down. For those in the community, the only thing that we can think of with regards to Van Russ is trying to have a bracelet with the address in case they get lost for those in the community, not in the nursing homes. Next slide, please. And these are the challenges that we were discussing. I think we have touched on earlier. Lack of trained staff or inconsistent use of the behavioral methods that we use. Training opportunities like these are quite important for staff to be up to date with the new developments and the, the new things that are online webinars that are available, which is good as well. And some talks like um, the one that we had from about sexualities and dementia, though it's a four hour talk, I thought that was a really valuable, powerful 
talk about those um, really challenging and dis challenging discussions that we tend that we tend to avoid. And combination of multiple patients. What I mean is that sometimes there could be a resident who calls out on a regular basis. They are not physically or they're not verbally aggressive, but they're calling out on a regular basis. And if there is a, I mean, resident to the adjacent room who has severe BPSD, I think that's probably trigger enough for the other resident to be escalated. And so how we manage, probably separating, but these are logistical difficulties that nursing home faces with regards to how to separate people, what are the means, and sometimes the uh, families come up saying, oh no, we can't have him moved to another room, rightfully so, because it's going to add to the confusion when they change his rooms and other things, but it's, a, it's not an easy decision to be made, and that's why uh, one of the, I mean, task that the nursing home does is really important, challenging. I mean, we give the orders, and we give the recommendations, but it's equally challenging on the floor to follow those recommendations. And you see sometimes um, we refer on to Dementia Support Australia, and when we get back the report, we have about 10 recommendations, and we see sometimes, is that something possible? For anyone to follow those recommendations when the people, when the resident is really escalated, probably not. And we need to find the reality with regards to the balance where we stand. And as we said, Cal backgrounds, but that's probably more towards the future. It's still not an area that is really prominent, though I had a recent referral, which I went to see in Brisbane, knowing by the name, it was clear that this person's mother tongue is not English. So Christy called up um, the facility to ask whether we needed an interpreter. They said, oh, no, clearly. There's no. She has been in Australia for 17 years. She has a good enough English to communicate, no problems. You, went, you go there, the son was there, and every time I ask a question, she would speak in Hindi to the son and tell him the answer. And I asked him why was there was no need for interpreter. Oh, when she's by herself, she would be able to speak in English. And I could see that that's, that was probably not a clear <laughs> way to do. But that's probably one of the things that is going to be a big upcoming issue into the future. And as I said, difficult families and sometimes unrealistic expectations take away a chunk of time dealing with those families and difficult situations. Next slide, please. So coming on to, I mean, non-pharmacological measures are something that we dealt with in some of the cases, but coming on to pharmacological measures, those are the list of things that are available. Antipsychotics, make sure that a clear discussion has happened with the family, consented before we start, explaining to them the risks, the side effects before we continue. Go slow with those medications and evaluate from time to time with regards to the need to continue those medications because at some point we might have started this medication because this resident is new to the facility and trying to get time to settle in, and they are arcing up. So once they have time to settle in, and when things settle down, it might be time to reassess the need for those antipsychotics and try to wean them off appropriately. The other medications, antidepressants, as and when needed, is important. The more evidence is towards SSRIs, SNRIs. Anxiolytics as well, not much evidence with regards to the same, but has been used in conjunction with other medications, explaining again they are going to be at risk of, increased risk of faults and other things. Mood stabilizers, not having again much evidence, but in conjunction, Valproate has been used when they have a pre morbid personality that can be challenging, 
and respiridone by itself is not effective enough. We do trial that as well. Colonic stress inhibitors, if we have started that and the resident is on colonic stress inhibitor and is being transitioned to a nursing home, those are situations I try to not make any medication changes, leave them on and reassess maybe in a few months time. But do they have much evidence? Still, it's not of much evidence with regards to advanced BPSD. But when you have tried all the others and we need some other measures, definitely a adjuvant to be used. And need to understand that some of the behaviors like simple wandering, simple calling out on a regular basis, is not going to change by medicating them. It's, you're just adding to their risk factors, you're adding to their problems. There are other, I mean, other issues like verbal, physical aggression, and sexually inappropriate behaviors or depression that can be treated with medications and it is effective, but not the ones where people simply wander. And probably, they are probably new to the facility and they're wandering off looking for the, for the loved ones and they're getting lost. So just need to give them the time to settle down, redirect them and bring them back. Next slide, please. And this is one of the dementia, specialized dementia care program facilities in Brisbane for really resistant BPSD where the medications are probably not effective still. And we have been trialing multiple medications. The problem with this is that they have only few beds. I think about 12 beds or something in Brisbane between two facilities managed by geriatrics from PA. And we had at least a couple of referrals, at least two referrals, not had any luck so far being accepted. So, um, but yeah, something that could be referred um, when we have difficult patients. Next slide, please. So that's the key take home message. Engagement, understanding, time, educating, and always trial non-pharmacological measures before we speak about pharmacological measures. And next slide, please. So these are some of the miscellaneous things that come up. Firearms at home, and especially in the rural setting. Um, I mean, these are not nursing home patients, but I had few instances where People have come to the memory clinic and, I mean, it was new to me. I was not clear with this, but fortunately, the staff that was helping me with the memory clinic do remember that you should probably ask them whether they had firearms. And yes, they had. One of them was a 55-year-old who was very young onset dementia, who had low mood and when we asked about, I mean, and he was living rurally, and um, he had firearms, so we had to speak to the family and tell them that they need to change the license or hand over the firearms and make arrangements. And he was all right with that, but those are discussions that needs to be had. The other things, the common things is the license. I'm sure most of you would be aware of, especially those in the community, palliation, diet, I would say some of the things about diet is making sure that you have quality of life at the forefront when you are trying to discuss about, I mean, when you are trying to prescribe some diet. Don't, I mean, it is past the stage where well, Lemia had said about the diagnosis phase. These are people at the terminal end of dementia and BPSD where I would say go with what they like and having the discussion with the family around risk feeding and all those options are quite important as quality of life measure. And of course, having the discussion around palliation when it comes down to that point. Next slide. Yep, thank you. Any questions, please?
Um, do you have any general comments on when to cease uh, um, the dementia medications? So obviously we had the case of the 90 year old, but do you have any general advice? So having a discussion with the family around how they have been after the medications have been started and having that sense of feeling whether the patient has clearly deteriorated. I mean, you could do a cognitive assessment and see, I mean, a simple MMC to see and compare how things are. But as with any cognitive assessment, I would say history plays a significant role. So getting that part of history, I do remember once in a memory clinic, we had a patient that came back and I, I mean, sent home on a recept, came back, and I'm clearly with it when I found that the person had not made any significant improvement. Actually, cognitive decline was getting worse, but the husband was clear in stating, whatever magic pill you had given was working. It was like, on what aspects? Oh, well, he had about two or three reasons, and I was like, okay, carry on. Sometimes it's about understanding those, I mean, I don't know whether I was treating him rather than her in this case. But you need to have both of them into consideration. So, yeah. I'm, I need, I'd like to hear your advice about the downside of the anti-dementia medication. So when you say talk about risks and benefits, what risks do you talk about with the families? You mean with oh, medications right. like Donopexil? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, antipsychotics would be a different cup of tea, but you are mentioning about um, yeah, the cholinesterase inhibitors. Yeah. So with medications like Donopexil, you are probably putting them at risk of bradycardia if they're already having heart problems. So my conversation would be with them as, all right, if you have bradyc, I mean, if your heart rate is slow, I would prefer not to put you on this medication and risk going bradycardic to the point that you need a pacemaker, which is more harm than good for someone who has dementia. So those are the rational that I would say. I mean, gastric upset is probably not, the, not one of the serious problems. You, I mean, I advise them if they have a gastric upset, stop the medication, go back to your GP to let them know that you have stopped the medication so that they could investigate whether there was any other cause for the gastric upset, and if there was any other cause, whether she could go back onto the medication. Does that sort of help you? Yeah, I'm just wondering if there's any other serious side effects that you tend to discuss with the family or the patient. Uh, So, so you don't have to worry. You don't. Have, sorry, um, you don't have to worry about it long term usually, because usually we'll see them at the, at the beginning and we'll see them in six months. And if you haven't had an adverse reaction in that six months, you're not going to. So you don't have to worry about it. Sometimes they get nightmares and they don't tell us. Uh, in which case, some some take it at night. Just tell them to take it in the daytime. And if you still get nightmares, you can tell them to stop. That's about it. So I wouldn't worry too much about the very long term side effects. In fact, there are trials that show that, like Lemnia said. When you stop the nepazil, even though when you're doing well, or if, if they're in the moderate or severely advanced stages of dementia, when they're in a nursing home, when you don't think it's going to do anything, the trial has shown that when you stop it, uh, they get more BVSD. So just continue. Um, so like the 90-year-old with the nepazil 10 milligrams, the nepazil is the last one I would stop. If I ever stop it at all, I'll probably continue it. So the take-home message is that the nepazil is mostly harmless. It doesn't do much, but it might do a little bit. Okay? So yeah, unless it causes nightmares or bradycardia. But after two years of denepazil, if they get bradycardia, they need a pacemaker. It's not the, it's not the denepazil. Okay? They need a pacemaker. That's it. That's what the government wants. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's cheap though. I mean, yeah. Thanks, Ken. And one of the other things that I say is um, in these cohort of patients, when I have my um, advanced training register comes along. S with regards to the BPST management, I say this, 
I mean, there's no fixed guideline in managing these patients. So it's about trying to figure out which one fits in. I mean, don't go all guns blazing for sure. But I mean, is there any evidence to suggest Respiridone versus Olanzapine? And if they want to try one over the other, there's not much evidence to suggest that one is more beneficial than the other. Yes, they say Respiridone, but sometimes people one of them, some of them respond more to olanzapine than respiridone, so. Um, respiridone increases anxiety. So respiridone, when you really talk to your patients, increases anxiety. I hate it, it drops their blood pressure. It's one of the worst medications you give my oldies. I absolutely hate it. And why aren't we looking at something like the Alargactyl, particularly in our oldies that drink? Why don't you like it? Mm. So that's, that's what some of the experience each clinician has, and I would say, Quite a few clinicians would have stories to tell about what their experience is with regards to the how they have dealt with some of the medications and what their experience is with regards to respiridone versus cotiap. I mean, cotiapine is more, mainly something that I favor for patients with Parkinson's um, or Lewy body dementia and similar situations where I would prefer not to have. It's like Respiridone or Olanzapine. It's a last resort medication and often, often as we get in, there's lots of tests against this medication and, and it's true and these medications are not meant for dementia patients. But this drug can probably prevent the patient from being in the hospital for two, three months and having a fracture falling off in a, in, and also get hospital acquired pneumonia versus, I, when I first started as a geriatrician, I hated the drug because that's what we were told, not to use it. And, and I still feel that it is not, the, it's not meant for dementia patients. But at the end, with experience, I found out that most of the patients, I have written in the notes, this patient should not be on antipsychotics. And then to go in three years' time, the same letter I've done, to say start a small dose of uh, 2.5 milligrams because it's a, it's a rescue drug. The problem is if you have a wonderful, every wish has come true and we got one-to-one -one nursing staff to cater for everything, then we would not be using as antipsychotics as we do. It's a terrible situation to be, but Fortunately or unfortunately, this drug works for people to, but you should never use antipsychotics to sedate someone because that's where you need to. And once the dose goes above one milligram, you have to think twice. I, uh, I think most of the geriatricians would probably want a 0.25 to 0.5 milligrams just to get the edge out of it. And uh, it's a different talk altogether why they are not need to be given for dementia patients, but unfortunately, that's the reality we live in. Yeah. And we probably need to reassess from time to time. Absolutely, yeah. So that we come back and make sure that the, there is a need or there's no need, and if that is the case, slowly trying to ask, let me was saying, don't, I mean, if the patient is on 0.5, don't take it off completely straight away, but wean it off and see how things go. Yeah, but before you start it, obviously, anti, uh, Anticholinesterase inhibitor would be number one to start off, and this would be down at the last resort. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Susan, we might make you the last question. Uh, um, sarcopenia in patients with dementia, especially if they are in a nursing home and they're not moving and they're not eating well, should we be concerned about that? Should we try and push them to have um, protein supplements, more exercise? Especially those at home as well. I mean, it you can see how they struggle to get up from the chair and... Yeah, it's a good point, but I'll be torn between quality of life and what the wishes are. Are we pushing someone whose dementia is adv advanced to do something that they probably would not like? I mean, that's probably my take. I think, to me, I would say quality of life precedes such discussions. If they are interested, good. We can involve them in those activities, but um, I don't know if there is anyone else who has a different view.
talking about <clears throat> the people in the nursing home, actually not all of them, they have dementia. Mm. A lot of these people move to the nursing home because they just can't manage it in the community. Either social isolated or they have physical disability, you know, not let them live in the community. If we're talking about someone have no dementia, still cognition very good and, and you, you are worried about his mobility and they want some physio, I would recommend it that actually. You know, not bad time for them to have good quality life in the nursing home while they are, they are supported. But if I am talking, as Linson said, someone have severe dementia, I will not push for anything further, you know. These people, they reach this stage, it is very difficult to understand what you are saying. They have apraxia, you know, they will not follow the structure. I have that issue in rehab. I am looking after the rehab ward in the public hospital. If we have someone have, and usually they come after the stroke, you know, if the cognition being affected, their habitation will be so difficult, so difficult, because whatever information you give it to them today, they will not return it tomorrow. You will start from zero again. It will not be effective, you know. However, if it is mild dementia or no dementia at all, yes, they need to be treated similar to anyone. Yeah. I totally agree with Lemia on that, yeah. Thank you so much for that talk. Um, it was excellent, very interactive, and um, we really appreciate the acknowledgement of um, particularly the work our nurses are doing in the, um, both the practices as well as the facilities. And I think the GP community in general really appreciates Infinity, their visibility, their support, and, and just putting on events like tonight is amazing. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Final thought, uh, we should thank the PHN uh, for this uh, night. Without their help, we couldn't have done this. And uh, Jenny, uh, thank you so much. And you, it's, it's, you, I know how much effort you put into this. And thank you again. And again, Christy, you as our practice manager, I think you've done a lot of work behind, behind the scenes. And thank you to both of you and to you, Joe, as well. Thank you very much. Yeah.